OK, and so we go again. Um, the course is still biomechanics of injury and prevention, still looking at the fundamentals, though we're looking more at applied stuff now as well. Uh, and again, thanks extended to Jeanne and Dr. Jitendra. So this morning, we've covered the lower limb. This afternoon, we'll be looking at the upper limb. And then um, in the early evening, we'll be looking at the head, the neck, and the spine, all from a position of um, understanding the, the fundamental biomechanics and then looking at ways of um, managing injury uh, and injury risk. And so the upper limb is perhaps unsurprisingly not dissimilar to the, the lower limb. Here we have our femur in the lower limb. Instead, we term it the humerus here. It interfaces with the scapula. So it's not the pelvis, it's the scapula of the, of the upper limb. And the joint is not hugely dissimilar. We have a not dissimilar range of motion degree of freedom in our shoulder than we do our hip. Move down our humerus to our elbow joint, and again, functionally, we achieve similar characteristics than we do in the knee. The similarities continue. We have our larger radial bone and our thinner ulnar bone. The thinner bone again is on the lateral side, so it's on the outside of the, um, of the arm. And it enables us to rotate as well. We have a series of very small bones. These are the carpals. So there are our wrist bones. There are eight in two layers of four within here. In the foot, these were the tarsal bones of the ankle. And again, trying to avoid the same problem. These bones here are metacarpals, are in our hand. These aren't our finger bones. These are our hand bones that are tied again together with webbing. And that webbing extends over to the metacarpal of the thumb as well. And from that point downwards, we have fingers. We have one, two, three phalanges in the little finger and three phalanges across to the forefinger. We have two phalanges in the thumb. So again, very similar to the foot. One thing that's particularly common in the forearm is fracture. And again, mechanically, we're dealing with here relatively thin bones, but with the potential to have a load that is exceeding what they're designed for. So your leg bones, your lower limb bones are designed to be thick and strong and robust. And so it's hard to imagine many circumstances where you can actually fracture a leg bone yourself. Uh, and so if you were to jump off a wall, if you were to fall out of a tree, whatever kind of activities that kids would do, it's very difficult to fracture leg bones because they're made to support the body weight and then um, a proportion of that or, or multiple proportions of that again. They're a lot thicker and a lot stronger than the bones of the upper limb. But of course, it is quite feasible for a load that is greater than the load that these bones are designed for to be transmitted by the upper limb. If kids do those activities, if they do climb a wall and fall off, or climb a climbing frame in a playground and fall off, or come off their bicycle, then we can have two, three, four times body weight being transmitted quite easily through the, the upper limb. But these bones aren't biomechanically designed to withstand that. These bones are only biomechanically designed to withstand forces that are typical to be translated through the hand. So the upper arm or the upper limb is at greater risk of fracture than the lower limb because they are deliberately thinner and lighter bones, because they don't take anywhere near a proportion of body weight 
unlike those of the lower limbs. And so it draws us on to another bioengineering question that we've touched on uh, before now, but we'll touch on again. And that is bone repair. And it comes back again to this notion of bone remodeling. So here, and we've talked about this over some time as well, but this is the first kind of image we've used to discuss it. This is Wolf's Law or stress shielding. So Wolf's Law states that bones respond to stimuli of stress and strain. And here we have one of the bones in the, the forearm, the ulna. The top picture shows the plate in position. Can't really see it, there's a little lump there that you could perhaps imagine being the plate. And then the consequence of that plate's being removed. We can see there's an obvious reduction <clears throat> in cross-sectional area of the bone. That's because the bone has responded to the stress that's being transmitted through it during the time of repair with the plate. So the plate takes a lot of the load because it's a stiff structure. The relatively flexible bone is protected from any strain because the plate effectively performs that role. The immobilized bone is a lot stiffer than the normal bone. That's to say that our bone here, or our plates here rather, is protecting the lower, uh, the, the ulna. Here, we remove the plate and the ulna becomes at increased risk of fracture. So this notion of periprosthetic fractures, where when the implant stays in at the ends of that implant, there's a risk of fracture. We need to be aware there's an increased risk of fracture when a plate is removed. It also highlights the reason why plates need to be removed as well. You can imagine if this, was, if, if this plate was left in longer, then bone reabsorption would increase further still. Astronauts were an example of weightlessness that we used at the start of the week. In only four days, being up in space, then the bone is starting to remodel. The bone loses minerals. It loses it very quickly, but it's hard to regain or takes a long time to regain that strength. And so whilst a fracture may appear to be fixed, not only is there more fixing that has to happen behind the scenes as it were, but we also need to be aware of the fact that stress shielding may be happening or may have happened and so the bone is at greater risk of fracture again. This is an example of a biomechanical test in a laboratory, so perhaps not dissimilar to what may have happened here. <clears throat> and it comes down again to this issue of trying to measure the biomechanics of bone. And the little red wires that we can see are effectively attached to the outside of the long bone. And that long bone is happens to be a femur, but the same principles apply to the long bones of the upper limb as well. And what we're doing here is instrumenting the femur with strain gauges and measuring that strain that we talked about earlier on to see how the strain changes <clears throat> within the bones as a consequence of that implant. Shoulder implants at the minute don't exist in a huge amount of, um, or aren't used particularly widely. They're a very complicated joints to remodel or to, to, to um, re-engineer. And so these kind of studies are probably going to be replicated in the humerus at some point soon. Because whilst femoral replacements have been 
investigated for um, decades now. Shoulder surgery is, is a lot less prevalent. Why? Because currently the rates or the demand for shoulder surgery isn't as great. But as life expectancy increases, then that's likely to expose other joints to the need of replacement. And so whilst applying this technology to the upper arm is probably not hugely common at the minute, if you're looking at an area of trying to start up um, research in, then this could be a novel route to take. We can obviously do this using finite elements as well. So finite elements would enable us to computationally simulate this circumstance. And there were posters up in the lab that were doing just that of a long bone and measuring the predicted stress throughout the length of the shaft itself. But there's still and will always be a demand for experimental test setups such as this, because your FE results are only as good as the data at which you can validate against. It also allows you to more accurately represent bone tissue. Um, we said at the start that bone tissue is a composition of a hard structure and some fluids integrated with it as well. And accurately computationally simulating that behavior is quite demanding. We talked this morning about our motion analysis techniques perhaps not being sufficiently precise to measure any subtle displacements of the implant um, and relative performance. It would be reasonable to say that this setup has limitations, but also FEA has limitations as well. If we're trying to start um, designing highly precise implants that are going to need to last twice as long as they are, then we need test setup to accurately allow us to simulate the human body as, as closely as possible. This bone here is a plastic bone. A saw bone is the, um, the commercial brand name for them. Uh, and saw bones effectively have near exclusive control of the market. They've almost a monopoly on the market because of a lack of competition. And they are bones, this one isn't, but the most recent generation of bones from sawbone enable you to most accurately represent what's happening in a joint um, as best you can. And it needs this continual evolution of technology to make our experimental test as accurate as possible, because we're now looking for marginal gains. We're kind of drawing a comparison to sports here, where elite athletes are clearly very good at what they do. These are effectively elite implants. But we're after marginal gains still, or arguably you could say more than marginal gains. Where we have implants that last 20 years and we need them to last 30 years, we're looking for very small differences that we perhaps never had to consider looking for previously. Because we've done this relatively rudimentary setup, and it's got us to a good position where hip joints, knee joints, um, shoulder replacements used to last long enough. But as our life expectancy is increasing, our approach to implant design needs to, to take a step change as well, such that the length of time that they last is able to extend the life um, of your typical um, patient. So this study has merit. One of the limitations is using strain gauges, they only measure the strain at certain points. And so biomechanics is embracing new technologies. And it's quite common now to see papers, and we do it ourselves back in Cardiff, where we spray on a pattern, a random arrangement of dots. We then have two video cameras. We lock this into a machine. And we apply a load, a compressive load for argument's sake. And what we're trying to do is trying to better understand how the bone is responding to whatever intervention we may have. And so we may have put in a femoral head or a, a shoulder head or whatever else we might want to put in here to measure the consequence of our intervention. And 
whilst the strain gauges here give us an appreciation of the different strain at known points. This system, digital image correlation, gives us an opportunity effectively to have more than one strain gauge. So the computer system measures the relative change in distance between each of these two randomly allocated points. And so you end up quite quickly with a 2D, or if you stick your other camera over here somewhere, a 3D image of strain within a component. You can do this dynamically. You can continue to have the crosshead moving down. These are video cameras. And so you can take a 3D representation of strain with time. So you've got a 4D analysis of strain within a bone. That gives us a previously unprecedented level of resolution in terms of our data and the accuracy of that data. It's a step change from here to there. We can use the latest generation of synthetic bones. Ideally, we could even use human bones. So we're always looking for now relatively marginal gains in terms of our scientific approach and our engineering approach to better understand the biomechanics. This was sufficient 15, 20 years ago. That gave us data that we didn't have. Flash is going to be flat in a minute. Hmm. Ah. This gives us data that we didn't have and was useful. This technology now gives us a far greater resolution of the same data so that we can look for subtle differences between the biomechanics or whatever implants that we're choosing to test. And we continue to look for marginal gains so, such that we can continue to better understand the components that we're making and trying to correlate the longevity of these components with the underpinning biomechanics. And that's the, the thing that we're still trying to, to better understand. If we can find a way of removing all of this lab-based equipment and in some way measuring strains in vivo, remembering that we've got some kind of implants in our machine here. If we can find some way of measuring the strain in vivo, that's going to be a step change again. So can we come up with some wireless sensing that enables every patient to walk around and collect data via their mobile phone? The group of Bergman, the papers that we mentioned earlier on, had an antenna and a battery. And so that's, that's useful from an experimental point of view, but it's not going to give you the mass data collection that is in some way going to be useful to drive this subject forward. So we've had a step change from here to there. We've had a step change from there to FEA, but maybe this is the next opportunity that we're currently missing, to have some way of interrogating the body in vivo by using the technology in our phone to collect data immediately so you can correlate your clinical feeling, which is the, the thing that surgeons value so much, with your actual biomechanics. We can then go back and say, there was a patient whose implant lasted five years, and we can cross-check their data against the normal data. We can start to look at MR procedures. We can even start to look at the surgeon technique to try and identify where the successes are happening and what's causing those successes. So opportunity exists very much so and remains in this field for smart technology, smart sensing to try and push it along. And it's a good opportunity to highlight <clears throat> this website as well. This website is part of the International Society for Biomechanics. Um, and that highlights conferences and uh, position opportunities, job roles, job opportunities that are offered worldwide. Um, and one thing certainly that perhaps our undergraduates, when they come to us, don't fully appreciate is just how multinational biomechanics is. 
And we term our course medical engineering. And I suspect if you were to ask the, the pupils and their parents uh, as they get dropped off today, ironically in Cardiff, about medical engineering, they would probably say it's a very local thing to Cardiff and no one else really does it. Mechanical engineering is a worldwide activity that has massive companies that employs millions of people. And medical engineering is a little activity that kind of happens in Cardiff. And it might happen at a couple of other places around the UK that they may have seen um, via university advertisements as well. But we need to be and continue to push the, push the message that the biomechanics community is only going to make the progression it needs by having international collaboration and consortium. And the Biomechel website, which is run by the International Society of Biomechanics, is a, a very good example of that. And on here, you can find things like job opportunities and conferences and, and symposiums that are coming up. Uh, and it's a tool that is certainly by our, our undergraduates is underused. And so uh, I would encourage you to, to look at that. And it's those kind of interactions and, and events such as this that will hopefully identify new opportunities and match those with new skills to try and push the subject forward. <clears throat> yes. In individual measurements? Um, yeah. Yeah, I mean, it could be. Uh, and we use uh, video strain gauges. Um, and so you could put a marker here. You could put a marker there. You could set up your camera. And you can get some data. Um, that has a convenience factor that strain gauges didn't have. Um, it ultimately means that people that are more familiar with computer systems like the current population and, and emerging generations can plug in a camera and use it straight away. There's no fiddling around with gluing strain gauges on. So it's a more convenient system. But when we're dealing with a complex geometry, such as a bone, and you know the, the dream would be to have healthy human bones in here. Now, the question clearly ethically is, how do you get your hands on a healthy human bone? Um, but that would be the ideal scenario. Then you'd be wanting to measure as much detail from that um, test as you could. And so systems such as um, video strain uh, sensing is fundamentally limited versus something like DIC, where it gives you a, a bigger um, and more comprehensive picture. Presumably, you would need then some MR. Um, and again, where you start to have magnetic resonance equipment, then you have the issue of how do you get your testing machine and your magnetic resonance to tie in together. Um, here, we've got a big testing machine that we're using. Um, would there be scope to put that inside the environment that you need for MR uh, images? Um, and so when it comes to getting data from people, people are trying to use um, clinical imaging techniques. Um, they're trying in some way to tie that in with loading the joints in the machine to try and get some kind of data out. At some point, they will succeed with that. At some point, that will generate valuable data. Um, I think it's always going to be an expensive process, which will inherently limit the data that, or the quantity of data that can be collected. If someone somewhere who was expert at developing sensors could develop a wireless sensor that could be attached to the side of our bone plate, for example. So if we were to have our bone plate here, and we had some wireless sensors on the outside of those, then we could measure the strain in our bone plates. We could determine, um, we could cross-reference that strain with the rate at which the bone healed. Or you could go back into clinic and have some kind of x-ray or MR um, at relatively frequent intervals, and that data could be correlated then to the strain. So there's certainly a scope or opportunity for um, a new uh, field or a new emerging uh, kind of field that could be better established in, in sensing in vivo. Uh, and so anyone who's um, good at sensing and, and um, wireless sensing that's looking for opportunities in biomechanics, and there are certainly um, those that are available. Yes? Exactly right, yes. <laughs> yep. You're, you're dead right. And you're saying that drawing it sounds pretty easy. You have a machine here that applies a load. And you have a camera here that records strain. 
But as you correctly point out, to have those two systems running independently is effectively useless um, because you need ultimately to plot one against the other. And if one has started before the other started, how do you know which data is right? And so you need to effectively interlink the two systems so it, all the data is recorded at a central point. Um, and that is not as straightforward as it should be either because your tensile machine was probably bought, bought 10 years before your DIC machine from two different companies that have never met one another. And so you're always fighting against technologies that aren't really as convenient as you wish they were. And it's no one's fault that that's happened. It's just that as people have come up with new ideas and new applications, you almost want to adopt a technology that you're familiar with and bring it into a technology you've just heard of. Um, the trouble is when that original technology was designed, no one had the, um, uh, the imagination or perhaps the, the good fortune to predict the technology that we're going to try and merge it with 10 years later. Uh, and so if budgets were limitless, then you'd come up with this new idea and you'd go off and buy a brand new bit of uh, a brand new testing machine and a brand new DIC machine from the same company and make sure it was synchronized before it got delivered. But, but that never happens. And so you end up um, finding a clever way of synchronizing the two systems together um, and then finding a computer that's fast enough to record all that data at the same time. Um, it, it can be done. It's not impossible to do, but it's not quite as straightforward as it is drawing it on the board. So if we go back and look at our, <clears throat> our long bones in our arm, we can see that the bone material actually behaves differently depending on the orientation of a sample. So if you had to take our, our arm bone and take a, a longitudinal slice, i.e. a slice like that, and apply a load to it. Then we get the stiffest response. The bone is stiffer in that direction. If we take a different slice, at 30 degrees to the vertical, we'll find that the response is less stiff, and it fails earlier as well. It's exposed to less strain to a point of which it then fails. And again, a, a slice at 60 degrees to the vertical, and then at 90 degrees, and we have very different properties again. And it's that characteristic that then becomes very important to consider. Because if your finite element model doesn't replicate these relatively fundamental facts, then the accuracy of your FE model is going to be limited. That's not to say that it has no value. Far from it. It has value. But ideally, we want a finite element model that can accurately reflect this behavior. But the challenge is, how do you do it? How do you get an FE model that includes a fluid that is strain dependent that then can accurately be validated against an experimental model that doesn't exist? And so you're always fighting against a challenge that you hadn't really um, considered at the very initiation of the project. And we constantly draw comparison to our mechanical friends who, if they were doing this with some steel pipe as opposed to a pipe of bone, which effectively we're using, then that would be a, an experiment that would be absolutely fundamental and pretty straightforward to do. However, arguably, the value of us getting this right is of a greater impact than the equivalent mechanical study. And yet, our expertise at getting it right is far more limited because the technologies that are needed are um, not as well established and, and Protocols are emerging all the time. But that creates great opportunity for the next generation of, of bioengineer, biomechanical engineer, without doubt. How do we solve these tasks that are relatively trivial now in, in mechanical engineering, but are fundamentally limiting um, the quality of the work that we can do? <clears throat> 
And we did a similar study to this, where we kept the, ba uh, kept, kept the base fixed and we rotated the top, and we looked at the angle of fracture. And so we used bones out of a cow to start with, and then we moved on to smaller bones from a pig. And we were trying to measure with the rotation of the top, whether you could get any trend in the angle of fracture that happened. <clears throat> we know when we rotate a bone that we get what we call a spiral fracture. So this fracture will continue around the back of the bone and go upwards in a spiral. And we wanted to use our biomechanical knowledge to help clinicians out in a different way. Clinicians, and in particular clinicians that deal frequently with children and very sick children, have to make decisions based on the likely cause of injury. With adults, the likely cause of injury can be explained by someone who has um, rarely got any ulterior motive, who has rarely got a need to be dishonest. Or the accident will have happened in a place that has been independently witnessed. With children, very young children, that can be quite different. Injuries can arise in children and be presented at emergency rooms in children that have happened in the home. And that the only opinion that you have as to why that happened is the person that was looking after that child in the home. And so you immediately get to a stage where the clinician has to make a judgment as to what caused that injury, but has only got one person to get that opinion from. And so like making any judgment in life, we always look for more than one opinion so such that we can weigh up the balance of probability and risk to make sure that we're coming to the correct conclusion. And doctors have got the same dilemma. When a young child turns up to hospital with a serious injury, and there's only one opinion that can be given, they have to use their judgment to determine whether that opinion is correct or not. And irrespective of how small these bones are, irrespective of how weak they are, it's still quite demanding or requires significant load to cause a fracture in a bone. And so if a caretaker comes along, a parent comes along and says that my child fell over as they were learning to walk in my house and fractured a bone, then a doctor's got a right to be suspicious of that. Because lots of kids learning to walk fall over and the vast majority don't fracture a bone. And so clinicians turned to us to see whether there was anything we could do biomechanically to see whether there was a relationship between the energy within a fracture and the angle of the fracture. Because the angle of the fracture is something that can be measured uh, routinely via clinical imaging. So via x-ray, you can see the angle that the fracture has happened. Now, if there was a way of clinicians correlating the angle of fracture with the amount of energy in the fracture, they could then start to be more confident in the conclusions that they were drawing as to what caused that fracture in the first place. So that's to say, if actually that child hadn't stumbled and fallen in, in the house, but had actually in a fit of rage by the parent being swung around by their ankles or by their wrists, and that had caused fracture, the clinicians wanted some biomechanical assistance to help them differentiate between those two very different scenarios. It could have been an accident, but of course it could have been non-accidental, it could have been deliberately caused. And so we published uh, a paper using uh, initially bovine tissue, so cow bones, and then later porcine bones, looking at trying to correlate the amount of energy that's required to fracture a bone with that angle to try and give clinicians an insight into what the potential cause could have been if a child is turning up with a fracture of one angle or another. And by no means is that meant to be 
their entire rule book. But what we were trying to do here was use biomechanics and the consequence of biomechanics relative to the ability to predict injury fairly accurately to give that information to clinicians, to give them an additional um, resource to try and make a judgment as to what had caused that injury. And so these trends are well established in adults. We were trying to add value to the literature by doing a similar analysis, looking at repeatable or the generation of repeatable fracture patterns. But again, there's still scope for that to be improved. Our animal models are always going to be limited, are always going to be a fundamental weakness of our study. But as you become more expert in biomechanics, getting access to, to human tissue is something that is, is notoriously difficult. So these trends and, and trends such as these are, are useful. And it allows us, if nothing else, to, to appreciate where bone sits versus other materials. And this plot at the bottom here is not dissimilar to the graph over there. So it's looking at how the bone changes its behavior as we load it at different speeds. So at the fastest speed, the bone is its stiffest. At the slowest speed, the bone is its softest. And so you increase the load. Come back to life in a minute, I'm sure. Um, if you increase the load, then its response changes. It's a viscoelastic material. As with any mechanical test, this data is quite valuable. It enables us to measure the ultimate force, i.e. the maximum load that the bone withstand before failure. The amount of deformation at failure, i.e. the strain. And then the area under that plot gives us the energy absorbed before failing. And it's interesting that children's bones tend to absorb more energy than adults before failing, and yet they're weaker. So they're more elastic but they fail earlier. And failure is a strange thing in bones. You can have one significant load and you will breach the threshold of injury. Or you can have one repetition that can be very high and you cause fracture. That, that we understand. But perhaps less obvious is you can have a lower load, but that fracture be, or that repetition be far faster or far greater. And you end up also moving into the injury boundaries. That injury is um, typically a micro, uh, a micro fracture um, that are typically found in sports. So approaching two o'clock, anyone got any questions on that lot? Um, it, it, it depends on the type of fracture, um, and it depends on how it's caused. So there are some instances where you can be, um, so for example, if you're running and you were to stand in a pothole, for example, then it, it's quite possible that your muscles could be contracted or that you could be physically active, and as a consequence of an external load, then you would you have a fracture, probably of your ankle or your lower leg. So it's unlikely to be the muscles that caused it, but it's probable that the muscle activation to coincide with the external load might actually make the situation worse. Um, the reality is it's very rare that you get the opportunity to, um, to measure any kind of failure within a laboratory environment. We're talking uh, last night, and um, there was data that's been recorded uh, previously of an Achilles tendon rupture in a lab. Um, and that's, that kind of data is, is highly valuable to the biomechanics community to help understanding um, tissue failure. 
but in reality, you can't deliberately go and cause failure in the laboratory because that's unethical. And so you're either waiting on a moment of um, severe misfortune for a participant um, to collect data, or you're trying to uh, model it using um, computational models. Finite element is one way of doing it, and so you could perhaps look at the involvement of, of muscle, um, or using, um, using uh, skeletal modeling. Um, so for example, there's OpenSIM software that's used here. Um, there's anybody that's used um, as a technology um, in kind of other parts of the world as well. But they start to enable us to predict what's happening and, and to look at the correlation of muscle force and external load on a, a potential injury um, characteristic or a mechanism. Um, so it's probable that muscle activation will play a role in, in making some injuries worse. The reality is, how would you avoid that happening? It's not as if people know they're going to get injured and so can, can deactivate muscles or not activate them anyway. Uh, and so perhaps the research value of, of exploring that further would perhaps be limited. Um, just because even if you did find the answer out, there is nothing reasonable that someone could do to avoid that situation happening anyway. Um, but certainly there are increasing... Um, value in the computational modeling community that's given to musculoskeletal modeling um, and the ability of using the skeleton and muscle models to more accurately investigate what's happening um, inside the body. We could certainly, uh, I guess, exoskeletons is, is where the question is pushing towards. I mean, um, armies are looking at this in, in greater detail. Um, can you um, override the fatigue that the body is exposed to by doing a lot of the work for it? Um, uh, and so I certainly think that there will be scope and, and advantage in that. Um, I think it's probably one of those technologies that will develop from the army first because you can see the, the, the wider benefits and then perhaps from a clinical perspective, come into play more to help those who are physically less able. Um, and so you can see people with severe disabilities perhaps having an exoskeleton in the future so that they can um, retain or regain their independence. Um, so I think there's certainly great value that one could imagine quite easily um, of a successful exoskeleton project. Um, and I think that's the key to biomechanics, is that there are lots of things that you can investigate, and there's almost an infinite number of questions that can be asked because the human body is as complex as what it is, and the field is as, as new as what it is. Um, but trying to identify the correct questions to ask, um, because ultimately the world of universities, both here and, and in the Western world as well, relies on funding. Um, and so it's up to us to ask pertinent questions to funders to, to make it obvious why our, our final outcomes will add value. Um, and so for exoskeletons, you can imagine that there's quite easily um, value to be added to a number of communities um, if that's to be successful. Okay. How much? Hmm. So that 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 be yeah the strange distribution. So you'd probably then go to a finite element model or some kind of computational model. If you were that the, the benefits of the computational models is that they're generally validated and so you can rely on them for one-off applications. Um, and so if you were trying to um, solve a particular question, um, then you would turn to one of the established modeling packages, you would input that data and you'd get an answer out that would be probably accurate or certainly sufficiently accurate for you to go and base further um, uh, research questions on. The reality of doing something experimentally instead is, is really quite demanding if we go back to that slide there. The alternative of trying to get a humeral bone and a radius and an ulna and to have some muscles in there as well and to apply a load and to see when it fails is, is incredibly complex and the, the error that you would incur in there would be huge. Just because to get a human arm for a start is, is challenging to say the least. 
So you'd end up using a cow leg or something else. Um, the muscles wouldn't be activated because clearly you'd have excised a leg from the animal. Uh, and so experimentally, that process would uh, increment so many errors as to your result at the end of it all being pretty much meaningless. And so that's where the value of the computational packages comes in. If you knew the type of the precise question that you wanted to ask, then there would be software packages out there that would give you a fairly good answer. Um, and so that would probably be the way to go. Corticals are on the outside. So what we can see here is cortical bone. What you can't see, if we just slice through it, there's cancellous bone inside. And so the cancellous bone um, is not as strong as cortical bone, but it is a lot lighter. And so you can achieve the required strength of a, a leg bone or a, um, an upper limb bone by having um, an outside um, covering of hard bone, but the inside being a lot lighter, but still adding to the strength. And so the combination of those two materials, that composite material, gives the required strength. Yep. So the, both of the radius, ulna, and humerus all have a cortical outer and a cancellous inner, and then a gap in the middle, which is the, the canal. Um, so the composition of all the long bones is the same, but obviously they're their absolute dimensions vary. Their relative dimensions are pretty much the same, but their absolute dimensions, um, their absolute width um, will change. The leg bones are a lot thicker and a lot stronger than the arm bones. Short break then, I suppose. Yeah.